Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Clark, research analyst with Money Market. So with your weekend edition of the Bull and the Bear podcast, now before we start, do want to make sure that you are checking out our website, moneyandmarkets.com, every day. Uh, safe, sound, smart, simple, profitable investment information for your portfolio. Chief investment strategist, Adam O'Dell, Green Zone Fortunes co-editor, Charles Sizemore, myself, and the rest of our team work very hard to provide you that information uh, to use to bolster your portfolio. When you're at the website, make sure you do sign up for our day, free daily e-letter. Uh, you'll get all that information sent to you into your inbox each and every every day, including the weekends, for free. Now, today we're going to talk about something that, ha that impacts everyone, uh, but it's kind of a difficult concept to grasp. And, and we're going to try to boil it down a little bit, but we're also going to take kind of, of, of an investor approach and, and talk about what you can do uh, uh, as an investor regarding trends in this particular, uh, with this particular uh, topic. And, and uh, you know, it impacts how we spend our money. It impacts how we invest in the market. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And what I'm talking about is inflation. Uh, simply, and I may be really oversimplifying the, the concept here, but inflation is the general increase in the price of goods and services over time that correspond with a decrease in the value of money. It's a reduction in purchasing power of a currency over time. Uh, you know, it, it's the higher inflation is, the less valuable your dollar is. Uh, and I know, and I know, and I'm going to bring in Charles Sizemore here, and I, I you know, I, I'll probe him to kind of give a good, uh, a, a much better definition of inflation because it is a kind of a difficult concept. But in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, the price of goods and services remained relatively flat, meaning inflation did not necessarily jump up. Uh, to the rate it had in years before. And that was good news for both investors uh, and consumers. But it's not necessarily going to stay that way. Uh, according to the International Monetary Fund, the rate of inflation was just 1.3% uh, in, in 2020. That's the lowest it had been since uh, 2013. Uh, and considered just two years before the pandemic, inflation rate in the U.S. was more than 2.4%, which was double what it was in 2020. Now, the IMF uh, does project that the rate of inflation in the U.S. will jump to levels that we haven't seen since 2011. And that's when inflation was more than 3%. Um, and in March, uh, just to kind of put a little bit of a, a perspective onto it, in March, consumer prices jumped 0.6%. That is the largest one-month rise in more than eight years, according to Reuters. Uh, but remember, regular consumers aren't the only ones who look at inflation. Investors, investors do as well. When inflation raises, income stocks like those that pay a dividend can sometimes have a tendency to decline. Uh, I'll throw one more stat out your way, a little more complex, but the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis calculates the 10-year break-even inflation rate on a daily basis. Uh, this is where the where market participants kind of expect inflation to be in the next decade on the average as it relates to 10-year Treasury securities. Uh, the chart uh, shows a pretty solid rise in those expectations. As for now, uh, the latest value is around 2.36%, but it is going up. And it means the expectation, the expectation for inflation is that it will move past the Federal Reserve's target rate of 2%, uh, perhaps sooner rather than later. Now, there's a lot of that to get into. There's a lot of figures, a lot of definitions and terminology to talk about. So I'm going to first bring in uh, Greens and Fortunes co-editor Charles Sizemore. Welcome. Uh, welcome back to the podcast, Charles. Uh, you know, first off, I, I want you to start off with kind of giving maybe a, a little bit more general definition of inflation. And then, uh, you know, give me your take. Is it, is inflation expected to take such a dramatic turn upward? Yeah, sure. So inflation is one of those things that can get sort of political. And um, I don't like to do that. I like to be more just, the, hey, these are the facts, ma'am. You know, no, no, nothing else, right? Um, the economist Milton Friedman his famous quote, I'm going to butcher it, I always butcher quotes, but to paraphrase his quote, inflation is forever and always a monetary phenomenon. Yeah, that's kind of this prevailing idea in a lot of circles that inflation is always just a product of the Fed. And that's a partial truth, but it, that really doesn't tell the whole story. There's really kind of two, two sides to this, and both of them are in play right now. There's, if there is such a thing as good inflation, and that's sort of a, you got to do air quotes, um, good inflation would be demand pull inflation. Like prices are rising because there's a lot of demand, because you know people are excited, because the economy is growing, because whatever, uh, that creates buying power and that causes prices to rise. Uh, you see that in you know the housing market or in in a, in a trendy neighborhood or something like that's kind of demand pull inflation. The the bad kind or the worst kind, if you will, is uh, cost push inflation. This is where prices are rising, not because demand is up, but because supply has been constrained. You see this, and we've talked about this in podcast, um, you, you see this in certain pockets of the market, such as microchips, 
right now, microchips are in really short supply. Uh, good luck. My kid wants a gaming computer. Yeah, good luck buying the parts. Um, my son may have to go get a paper route or something. Well, that's silly. No one actually gets newspapers anymore. But it, son may need to go get a job in order to pay for the video card because, um, you know, conditions are so tight right now in that space. Um, it's causing prices to rise. You see that in lumber right now. Uh, think back to the 1970s, you know, the, the Arab oil embargo, that uh, the, the OPEC oil embargo that, um, uh, that caused fuel prices, that really caused a recession here. That was a, that was cost push inflation. So um, you know, there, was, there was disruptions to the supply lines that, that caused you know, prices to rise. So what do we have today? It's a mixture of the two. You know, you, you do have that cost push inflation because we, the pandemic really messed up uh, global supply chains. And that's, we're feeling the effects of that a year later. Those, you know, sawmills and whatnot that were closed a year ago, the lumber that they would have produced is not showing up in Home Depot today. So that's, that's where we are there. But you also have demand pull. And this is where kind of the Fed comes into play. Because the Fed has kept interest rates so low, it has just kept a ton of liquidity in the system, and Congress has given us a ton of stimulus money, uh, you know, additional unemployment benefits, et cetera. I mean, they're just throwing money away, throw, you know, passing money out like candy on Halloween. That has created a lot of demand that wasn't necessarily there before. So you have this combination of higher than expected demand, some supply constraints that is a recipe for inflation, at least in the short term. Kind of the final piece on that, and then I promise I will wind up this this diatribe, is that um, you do have a, sort of a base effect in that because prices were so low a year ago because you know everyone was stuck at home and not really buying much, your year over year comparables are going to look higher. It's going to look like inflation's running hot for a while because you're comparing it to a low number. Uh, the question is, how long does all this persist? Well, we'll see, but um, you know, for right now, we should see some real inflationary pressures and they probably won't go away tomorrow. Now, you know, just to kind of touch just slightly, you know, it, it, you, you kind of explained um, how it all works in, in the supply and demand. I think that's, that, that's what you can attribute to uh, the inflation drop off in 2020. Yeah, of course. In 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we had the economy was going at full speed and then demand just fell off a cliff. Nobody was doing anything. Nobody was buying anything. Nobody was going anywhere. So you had an excess of everything. You had an excess of uh, restaurant food, for crying out loud. I remember seeing a story about how the price of a certain type of onion plummeted while the price of other onions did not because this particular type of onion was an onion that tends to be bought by restaurants as opposed to bought by consumers at a grocery store. You had all sorts of crazy things like that. Uh, a total disruption of the economy and you did have, it's like a, someone, like a trap door fell and demand just fell through it. So that's exactly what happened last year. Now I wanna turn attention to Chief Investment Strategist Adam O'Dell and Adam, uh, welcome uh, as well. Uh, as an investor, tell me why I need to pay attention to inflation. Well, it's certainly going to have an effect on your bottom line. And I'll get to some strategies and tactics on that. But first, I want to give uh, Charles a round of applause. I think that was a great explainer. And I would expect nothing less from the uh, graduate of the London School of Economics. So very well done there. I, I mean, a question for you, Charles. I mean, do you think that most people are worried? You mentioned supply side and demand side. But then there's also the, the hyperinflation that you get uh, from the utter debasement of fiat currencies. You, you want to talk about Argentina or you want to talk about Venezuela or Zimbabwe dollars and things like that. I mean, you hear stories about where they wouldn't put a pr price on bread or they put it in like a, you know, dry erase because it was going up every five minutes or something for a loaf of bread. So, I mean, in your opinion, Charles, are most people worried about that type of hyperinflation uh, due to the, you know, unprecedented monetary policy and now the fiscal policy of the U.S.? Or do you feel like more people are worried about the kind of the more average inflation that just slowly, you know, de over a decade kind of eats at your purchasing power? I would say the most likely, well, the, the scenario that people worry about right now is more like that 1970s stagflation where prices rise, you know, monetary uh, policy is a big part of that, you know, fiscal policy is part of it too, you know, government deficits, all that. But you're looking at, you're looking at high inflation. And you're, I mean, the 70s were not a nice time to be investing. They were not a nice time. I mean, that was a rough decade, but it, it's not, Weimar Germany hyperinflation. It's not Argentina hyperinflation. It's not you know Zimbabwe hyperinflation. 
there is always that tail risk that something like that would happen, but you do have to have some faith in our institutions that the Fed is going to scale back and not, not let that happen. Um, who knows? I mean, you look at the price of Bitcoin, you look at the price of some of these, you know, kind of anti-dollar uh, asset classes, and perhaps some of that is investors just, you know, in the back of their mind, they think, well, why Mar Germany happened in a civilized advanced country? Why, why could that not happen here? So I, you, you could, mm -hmm. that could be part of what's motivating people. But I would say the more reasonable fear is more like a repeat of the 1970s. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that you uh, mentioned stagflation because that's, as I understand it, a period of both uh, low growth and high inflation, which is kind of like the, the worst of two worlds. Uh, the worst and, of all possibilities, right? Yeah, exactly. And it makes me think of, uh, you know, I'm a fan of the work of Harry Brown, the permanent portfolio, which for our viewers, I'll kind of try to summarize it and make it um, not exactly right. But the idea is to hold basically four asset, uh, asset classes uh, in equal proportion, 25% each. And the idea is that you really have these environments that work on two axes. One is based on growth. Is growth positive or negative? Or is it growth high or low? And on the other axis is inflation. Is inflation high and moving higher? Or is inflation low and moving lower? So you've got uh, basically stocks, bonds, cash, and hard assets, like often gold. Uh, so you know stocks do well in high growth environments. Uh, bonds do well in disinflationary environments. Gold typically does well in an, in an inflationary environment and cash typically does well during uh, deflation whenever everything is going down. So it gives you some dry powder there. So that's one you know, strategic allocation that I'm more of a tactical guy, but that's a strategic allocation that does protect you from that environment, whether it's just inflation, but high growth or whether it's stagflation with, with low growth as well. So uh, that's something I'm a fan of. So, for sure, for sure. You know, so how should investors prepare for this possible uptrend in, in inflation? Well, I mean, you have to decide w whether you want to predict the inflation. Um, so I think that it's interesting that Charles said it was, um, you didn't say religion, you said it's it a political discussion. I think that's, uh, I've, I've characterized it before as a, as a religious discussion, because if you talk to a gold bug versus a, a bond uh, strategist versus a currency trader versus a stock person, you're going to get different views on, on inflation. And I, I'm not a believer that you can predict those things with much accuracy. So um, if you do think that you can predict inflation, you certainly want to get into real assets. So uh, real estate, uh, you know, hard assets like commodities, basically. So anything that is not, uh, you know, a paper value like stocks or bonds uh, or even cash, but you want to get into things that are real assets uh, like commodities. Uh, but that's if you can predict it. So the other two options you have would be to have more of it like a, a hedge strategic position, which is what I just mentioned, the, the permanent portfolio, where you have some... Um, asset classes, gold or a broader commodities basket that will do well in an inflation env in inflationary environment and pair that off with your stock portfolio and your bond portfolio and, uh, and whatnot. So that's more of like a, an always on strategic asset allocation approach. And certainly in our, uh, in our newsletter, our monthly newsletter, Green Zone Fortunes, we have inflationary picks in there. So we have precious metals companies, we have some industrial companies that have exposure to commodity prices. And we do that because those picks, uh, we put them in our portfolio and we aim to hold them for three, uh, excuse me, six months up to three years. So we know that we're not gonna try to tactically trade the, around those positions too much. We'll certainly take profits in the short term if we, if we can and, and want to, but we're, we're looking to kind of capture those longer term trends. So we have positions in there that will benefit from an inflationary environment, but it's not all, all that, it's certainly diversified. Uh, the other approach would be to take more of a tactical approach. So like for instance, in my shorter term options trading service, uh, Home Run Profits, we basically make make bets over a two to three month two to three month time period. So uh, late last year, we started getting into oil company stocks, and uh, more recently, we made a play on a broad commodities basket uh, ETF. Mm -hmm. And we did that not because I have a strategic or a predictive view on inflation, but that's where the momentum was. So if you trade tactically, you can start to see where the market beating momentum shows up. And more recently, it's been showing up in the materials sector, in the energy sector, in the industrial sector. Those are all kind of signaling that the market participants are kind of um, positioning for higher inflation ahead. So you can do that on a tactical basis as well. 
Very good. And and we will try to provide uh, more information on how you can learn more about uh, Green Zone Fortunes uh, down below uh, on, on YouTube or somewhere uh, within our show notes uh, uh, if you're listening to this as a, as a podcast. Uh, real quickly, it is the weekend. Uh, we'll give you guys each 30 seconds, go around the table and give me your final thoughts. Charles? You know, I, overall, um, I, I do tend to think this this trend towards at least moderate inflation is, is, is likely. You do just have a ton of liquidity going into the market. I think that's or not just the market, just into the capital markets in general, stocks, bonds, everything. So I, I do think until something fundamentally changes, you know, the, the, this is the status quo. Like this, this is the trend. And Adam O'Dell, 30 seconds. I'll actually give away a ticker. It's uh, WTMF, and it's, that stands for the Wisdom Tree Managed Futures Strategy Fund. This is a basically a long, short, uh, quote unquote, trend following fund that I recommended as a hedge to a long equity book portfolio uh, back in late 2019. And basically, this is going to give you exposure to commodities, not necessarily always on the long side. Um, so it can go short commodities, but you're going to get exposure to energy, uh, grains, industrial metals, livestock, precious metals, the softs like you know corn and cotton, sugar, um, actually the corns and the grains. But nonetheless, it's going to give you exposure to the full basket of commodities. But um, and when the trends are higher, it'll go long. When the trends are lower, it'll go short. It also gives you exposure to currencies and interest rates. So basically, the three asset classes that you're missing if you're only invested in equities. So that's certainly a, 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 an adaptive tactical approach to trading the commodity markets. And if inflation kicks into high gear, high gear you're going to see all those commodity markets uh, be long. And that's about 65% of that book. So again, that, that ETF is WTMF. And that's certainly, uh, certainly worth a look in my book. Great advice, great information as always, gentlemen. Uh, again, uh, I want to make sure that while you're on YouTube, you check out a lot of the new, uh, a lot of the new stuff we have going on YouTube. Uh, we have our new video series with Adam Odell. Ask Adam anything. I get to sit down and I get to actually ask Adam anything. It's 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 phenomenal. I, the questions you provide, and it could be a question on the meaning of life. It could be on asking about what that thing is in the corner of his office, or it could be on how can I protect myself, uh, you know, uh, against uh, interest rates or something like that. It, it's it's a wide range. It's a great series. Invite you to check it out. Also, Charles Sizemore, uh, investing with Charles. Uh, if you are looking for income producing stocks, uh, the know how on, on what to look at, what to look for, Charles is your guy. Uh, so, investing with Charles Sizemore, also on our YouTube channel, both our weekly series. We do, uh, we, they do a video once a week. Plus, we have the marijuana market update as well as the bull and the bear. Uh, all that is on our YouTube channel. Leave us a review, uh, leave us a comment on YouTube. If you're listening to this as a podcast, you can do so on your favorite podcast indicator. Love your feedback. If you do have a question, or anything else you'd like to ask, you can email us at the bull and the bear at moneyandmarkets.com. Also head over to moneymarkets.com, uh, sign up for our free daily e-letter in it. We give you safe, sound, smart, simple, profitable investment information for your portfolio. So we've got much, much more coming up next week, including all the things I've mentioned. We may have more, but uh, make sure you're checking out Money and Markets each and every day. Sign up for that free daily e-letter uh, so you uh, get access to all that information right away in your inbox every single morning, seven days a week. Until then, this is Money and Markets research analyst and host of the Bull and the Bear podcast, Matt Clark, wishing you all safe trading.